My home is in Rooseville, Mississippi. It's located in the Black Belt of Mississippi, known as the Delta area. I was forced away from the plantation because I wouldn't go back and withdraw, you know, my literacy test after I had tried to take it. I wouldn't go back and I had to leave and my husband was forced to stay on this plantation until after the harvest season was over and then the man that we had worked for, he'd taken the car and the most of the few things we had had been stolen and I'd been in jail and I'd been beat. I had been to a voter registration workshop, you know, to they were just training and teaching us how to register, to pass the literacy test. And it was giving us enough training that we could tell other people, you know, how to pass the literacy test. So we had attended a workshop from the 3rd of June to the 8th. And then we got the uh, Continental Trailway bus to come back to Mississippi. And we got to uh, Winona, Mississippi, uh, I would say about 10.30 that Sunday morning on our way back to Greenwood, and that was, we had got in 25 miles of the voter registration headquarters. And the bus stopped in Winona, you know, at the bus terminal. And four people got off of the bus, you know, to use the uh, restaurant to get food, and two people got off, used the washroom while I was still on the bus. When I looked through the glass, I saw the people rush out. And one of the girls what had gone in the washroom, she just got back on the bus. And I stepped off to see what had happened. And uh, Miss Ponda told me that it was a state highway patrolman and a chief of police on the inside and began to tap them on the shoulders with billy clubs and ordered them to get out. And I said, well, this is Mississippi. So I got back on the bus, and as soon as I was seated, I saw them when they began to put the five people what was, you know, off the bus, but they wasn't over uh, six feet from the bus, began to put them in the highway patrolman's car. And I stepped off again because I was holding one of the ladies' irons, you know, that they was arresting. And she said, get back on the bus, Miss Hamer. And then I heard somebody scream from the car that she was in and said, get that one there. And then a white man stepped out of a car and told me I was under arrest. And when he opened the door and I went to get in the car, he kicked me. And they carried me on down to the county jail where they had the other highway patrolman had carried the other five. And they, you know, when I, we walked in, when I walked in with the two white men that had carried me down and they cursed me all the way down, they would ask me questions. And when I would try to answer, they would tell me to hush. And I, when, we, when I walked inside of the booking room, one of the policemen went over and jumped up on one of the Negroes' feet that was with us. And then they just began to, you know, put us in cells. And I was put in a cell with Miss Vesta Simpson. And after I was put in this cell, I could just hear some horrible screams and horrible sounds, you know, of licks. And I saw one of the girls was 15 years old was with us. And she passed my cell, and she was real bloody. And then they asked the little man that cleaned up the jail to go inside and mop up that blood. And then I heard some more screaming, and I heard some awful sounds. And I would hear somebody when they say, can't you say yes, sir, nigger? Can't you say yes, sir? And they would call her names that I wouldn't want to go on tape. And she said, yes, I can say yes, sir. So I said. And she said, I don't know you well enough. And I would hear when she would hit the floor again. And finally, she began to pray. And she asked God to have mercy on these people because they didn't know what they was doing. And after a while, they passed my cell door with this young woman, Miss Annelle Ponder. And one of her eyes looked like blood. And her hair was standing up on her head. And her clothes had been torn from the shoulder down to the waist. And then three white men came to my cell, and one of them was a state highway patrolman because he was wearing a little silver plate across his pocket that said John L. Bassinger. And he asked me where I was from, and I told him I was from Rouville. And he said, I'm going to check that. And he went out, and I guess he called Rouville. And they did 
didn't like me in Ruble because I worked with voter registration there. And when he came back, he said, you damn right, they said, you're from Ruble, all right. And we gonna make you wish you was dead. And they led me out of that cell into another cell. And he gave a Negro prisoner a blackjack. And he ordered me to lay down on a bunk bed. And a Negro prisoner said, do you want me to beat her with this, sir? And he said, you're damn right, because if you don't, you know what I'll do for you. And I laid down on the bunk like he ordered me to do. And the first Negro beat me. He beat me until he was exalted. And after he beat, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. And during the time he was beating, I began to work my feet because that was a horrible experience. And the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro that had beat to sit on my feet while the second one beat. And I just began to scream where I couldn't control it. And then the white man got up and began to beat me in my head. I have a blood clot now in the outer to the left eye and a permanent kidney injury on the right side from that beating. These are the things that we go through in the state of Mississippi, just trying to be treated like a human being. But still, this is called a part of America. The Justice Department brought a suit against these five law officials from Mississippi. And they had their trial in Oxford. And they had every evidence in the world if it ever was going to be any people convicted. Because we had flew to Washington, D.C. and had the pictures made, and they had the pictures today of what happened to us in that jail. The bus driver, they even had the waitresses from Winona at the uh, bus tournament that said we hadn't done anything. We hadn't done no demonstration. The Negroes that they forced to beat me, they came and they told the truth. They told how these white men had made them drink corn whiskey before they did beat us because they figured, you know, if they didn't have something in them that they might not do it. They told all of that and nothing have been done. Those same men, I guess, are still wearing their guns. They are very powerful in the state of Mississippi. But some of the people, I think, is beginning to get where now they just don't care. They are beginning to see if they try to do anything for themselves, well, they'll be killed anyway, because it's nowhere that I would call myself going in the state of Mississippi to be protected by a police official, because they are worse than a savage. As you know, the three civil rights workers that was murdered in Mississippi, they say their civil rights hadn't been violated, but they are dead. In fact, the same men uh, Rainey and Price was assisting the people across the street when they was having memorial service this year for Cheney and Goodman and Michael Strona. And Michael Strona was a Jewish person, mm. but he was one of the greatest men I ever met. I knew him very well and his wife, Rita. And, and you know, I couldn't have went there for a memorial service, not and let these same two police officials guard me across the street. I wouldn't have been low enough to low their death to go across the street, let them guard me across the street. When if it hadn't been for them, they wouldn't have been dead. The way I got involved in the Freedom Democrat Party is we tried to get in the regular Democrat Party. We tried from the precinct level up to the county and from the county to the state. I remember when we tried to attend the precinct meeting at the little polling place in Roosevelt. It was eight of us, eight Negroes, went up to visit the precinct meeting. And the door was locked, and we couldn't get in. And we stood on the outside and held our own meeting. If we hadn't tried to go in it, and then just set this one up, they would have said from the beginning, if we had tried, we could have got in theirs. We elected our chairman and our secretary our delegates and our alternates, and we passed the law to resolution. The 24th of April in 1964, 
we organized at the Masonic Temple in Jackson, Mississippi, the Mississippi Freedom Democrat Party. And then the 24th of August in 1964, we went to the National Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, to challenge the seating of the regular delegation from Mississippi. We got quite an education in seeing what the whole Democrat Party of this country was like. In fact, I cried. I don't know would I really been involved in politics now if I had known it was like it is. We was offered two votes at large as a compromise in the convention. But after 100 years, we wouldn't accept a compromise because it didn't mean anything to 63,000 people at that time was registered with the Freedom Democrat Party, so we didn't yeah. compromise. So again, in January, beginning the 4th of January, the three candidates from the Freedom Democrat Party, Mrs. Gray, Mrs. Devine, and I went up before the door of the House of Representatives to contest the seating of the five representatives from Mississippi. And we was turned away, and we wasn't allowed to even go in to have, you know, to contest their seating. We didn't go there to be seated because we knew from the beginning that we wouldn't be seated, but we wanted to explain our side, whereas in a state that 42% of the people can't register, they wasn't representing us. And I think somebody, it's time now for somebody to be in Congress that's going to represent the people of Mississippi. And we weren't allowed to go inside, but that didn't stop the challenge. We did have that day 149 congressmen that stood up against these people being seated. So we are still working with this challenge, and we hope by the last of this month, which is August, that we will have a chance to unseat these congressmen. Because actually, this voting bill that the president passed last week, it doesn't mean anything. And I'm not looking for a voting bill in 1965 when they are not enforcing the voting bill and our voting rights with the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed us the same rights to vote from the 15th Amendment in 1870. And at that time, 1870, Mississippi was readmitted back to the Union because they promised at that time that they wouldn't do anything to disenfranchise Negroes to keep them from registering to vote. So now it's a matter of a violation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. And what I'm curious to see, do the Constitution of the United States mean anything? 